King James or four generally agree that these two ancient Bibles were put out by Constantine. And here we have an Arian putting out these Bibles. Now the modern versions of the Bible are primarily based on that, and we'll get around to that. But at the Council of Nicaea 325, there's a guy named Athanasius, and you've all heard about him because he took a stand like you're taking a stand. It may not have been a popular stand at the time, and Athanasius was banished five times. And um, Athanasius says, if Jesus Christ is not God, he cannot be our Savior. And that's one of the issues that are involved in, in the Bible translation thing, because the modern versions take Jesus' name out a hundred times. They don't believe Jesus is God. And they all tell you what they believe. In Luke chapter 2, Jesus is talking in the temple. And when he's talking there, his mother and Joseph, they wonder where he is. And finally they come back and Mary says in front of this crowd, when Jesus is 12 years old, your father and I have sought you sorrowfully. She's probably covering up. And uh, so Jesus at that time, he rebukes her in a way publicly. And he says, I must be about my father's business. Jesus never called Joseph his father. And so... In that very same chapter where Jesus rebukes his mother and says that God is his father, every modern version says in Luke 2.33 calls Joseph Jesus' father. And I tell you, that was the thing one day. I can remember the time and the place when I was reading in a modern version and I read his father and his mother. I thought, what in the world's going on here? And I looked in the King James and said Joseph and his mother. I looked in the Nestle's Greek text and uh, that we studied in school, and it said his father and his mother. Wow. And that tells where these modern perversions come from. They don't even believe Jesus was God Almighty. Right. And so that's why it is such a fundamental issue that we're talking about. And they have the NIV. You know, uh, there wasn't any fuss about leaving out the names of Jesus in the NIV, but now they decided in the new NIV to make it gender neutral, as they call it. That's communism, by the way. That's right. And, and so they, there was a much bigger fuss over that than kicking out Jesus in a hundred places, which is amazing to me, you know. Yeah. So, um, anyway, we get down to Athanasius, and then uh, I'm getting the bad guys and the good guys in here. The next individual is Demasis, and in the year 380, Demasis united the ancient religion of Rome with Christianity. And he was uh, one of the first to take the title Supreme Pontiff. Uh, and so the popes have used that, and in come the Dalis, and in come all the pagan stuff that is connected with Christianity under Demasis. And then Demasis had a guy working for him, a secretary, his name was Jerome, and so he had Jerome put out a translation of the Old Latin. Now it's important to understand, when the New Testament came out, there was three, uh, two translations in the main text. The first text, the Koine Greek text. Everybody in the Greek class, the first thing they learn is that the Koine Greek text is the text the New Testament was written in. But the modern versions are not based on Koine Greek text. They're based on classical Greek that was changed by a guy named Origen. Let's give the, show the difference. For instance, the common Greek text King James is based on, it's like row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, merrily, 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 life is but a dream. The classical Greek Propel, propel, propel your craft placidly down the liquid solution. Statically, ecstatically, ecstatically, existence is but a delusion. And so that would be your classical. And so they teach preachers now the most difficult Greek reading is the best. Well, why is it the best? So the people use the corrupt uh, Bibles and corrupt uh, translations. So anyway, um, this uh, we, we get to Constantine and then we go from him to Demasis, and, and so Demasis has Jerome put out uh, a revision of the Old Latin. Now, the New Testament is translated into Latin, Old Latin, and it's called the Italic Text in, the, uh, in about 135. It was translated Syriac Peshitta in about 135. All three of these back up the text behind the King James Bible, and so the evidence is overwhelming. And so... The Old Latin is revised to become the Vulgate. And this Vulgate text, since they had the true text before that, when somebody would get a copy of it, many times they would just change it back into what the true text said. So the Vulgate had so many readings that the scholars today say they don't know what the true readings are in the Vulgate. Now, some of the people that were the, the good guys, let's put it, that stood for the Lord, 
was an individual named Patrick. And you can read Patrick's writings today. He's also known as St. Patrick. We have a Baptist saint, but of course we know we're all Baptists. So anyway, or all saints. And so anyway, uh, Patrick, um, he is brought up in a church. He doesn't think about the Lord. Then he's kidnapped, taken to Ireland as a slave, sold on the auction block. While he's there on the mountainside, he's thinking about the Lord, and he's gloriously converted to Jesus Christ. And he's praying all the time. And then finally, after about seven years, uh, he feels like the Lord's saying escape. And so the Lord helps him to escape. And he goes back to France. And then from there, he goes back to his homeland, which is in the area of Wales. But in the year 432, when he's 45 years old, he feels like he ought to, God is calling him back to Ireland. And he goes with about 12 people uh, as a missionary to Ireland, Ireland. And he's supported by the Welsh churches which basically held uh, Baptist teachings. They were Baptist churches, doctrinally speaking. When we say Baptist, we're talking about the doctrine. And they taught believers' baptism. They taught the Bible is the final authority. They rejected the Rome, Roman church. And he goes back there, and immediately he's, uh, somebody attacks him, but God preserves him. He starts preaching the gospel. Then he decides to go to his old master's home, and his old master was so afraid of him, he burned down his house with himself in it and committed suicide. Well, Patrick uh, was valiant. He, was, uh, uh, he stood up for the Lord, and that's what we need to do. You know, I believe we ought to teach our history in the churches because they need to hear it. The Old Testament is based on the history of God and man and God revealing himself to man. And so we ought to teach it to them, to the churches. And so... Uh, Patrick wants to talk to the king of Ireland, and they have a special holiday, and all the smaller kings come, and then the top king, and he made a law that nobody could burn a fire until he started a fire on that particular day. Well, Patrick wanted to talk to him. He, the king wouldn't talk to Pat, so uh, Pat um, went up to a nearby hillside and started a fire. And the, if anybody started a fire before the king, that was the death sentence. But he started a fire so that he would be forced to see the king. So the king had him arrested. And he preached the gospel to the king. The king didn't kill him. But you talk about having guts. And the Holy Spirit will give us that power. Amen. You know, I was, uh, they talk a lot about the power of the Holy Spirit today. And you know what Jesus said in Matthew? All power is given unto me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. You know, if we go, the power is turned on. Amen. That's where I read that. Go therefore. I got the power. You go, therefore, and start preaching the gospel, and I'll send the power behind you. Amen. I'll send it with you. And so he, uh, the king doesn't get saved, but a number of his family children get saved. And so he's taking them with him as he's preaching, and he's teaching them and educating them. Patrick dies, and when he dies, uh, uh, he has stated in his writings that he had baptized 120,000 adults, started 360 actually Baptist churches there in Ireland. And the missionaries pour out from Ireland uh, all over Europe preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a glorious story that is. And when one of the missionaries goes out, his name was Columba, and in order not to have the government control him, he goes to the island of Iona and he sets up a mission station there, and then from there the missionaries are sent into Scotland and then down into England. Somebody says, well, how did Pat become a, a, a Roman Catholic? Well, he became a Roman Catholic about 200 years after he died. And he didn't have any say about it. And uh, so it was at the Council of Whitby in 664 where the Roman Catholics took over the, uh, England. And at that time, to get those Baptist churches into the Roman Catholic Church, they made a saint out of Patrick at that time. But he didn't have any say in that. Now, uh, uh, in relationship to the text, we know that he used the old Latin text, the Italic text. You say, how do we know that? You know, well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, we know it because it's in the museums. The ancient museums, these Bibles are in the museums and they line up with our authorized King James Bible. And so this text was being protected by the Lord as well as the preaching of the gospel. Now we switch over to uh, the East. And there was a man named uh, Constantine. And it's not the dictator, not the general. It was 640, and somebody left him a copy of the Koine Greek text, the received text behind the King James Bible. 
And he read it and he got saved. And he kept reading the Bible and kept getting excited. And so he started to preach. And after a while he had a congregation there that he was preaching to. And they heard about it in Constantinople. You know, at that time, they had an emperor in Constantinople, and they heard about it, that he was preaching, and they called him a heretic. You know, Paul uses that word heretic, and I, I like the way he used it. He says, after the way that they call heresy, I worship the God of my fathers, believing all that is written in the Law and the Prophets. Right. He believed 1 John 5, 7, Mark 16, 19, Amen. 20. He believed it all, see? Right. And a good Christian believes everything he reads in the Scripture. Amen. And so they call him a heretic. And one of the names for Baptists during that time was a heretic. Because they went by the Bible instead of going by the church fathers who they called church babies. Anyway, so the uh, Eastern Roman Emperor sent out a policeman named Simeon. And he goes out and he uh, finds out where Constantine is. And uh, they had a pretty good church there because he's told them to repent of their heresy, which was believing the Bible alone. And he said if they didn't, he would uh, put them to death, stone them to death. And uh, they had a pretty good church because there's only one guy that wanted to stone the preacher in the church. That's pretty good, you know. And so uh, they put him, uh, at that time, uh, the pastor was put to death and all the people in the church were put to death by this police, policeman, Simeon. And then he goes back to Constantinople and he reports, they're all gone, I killed them all. And uh, after a while, he's thinking about the gospel because he heard somebody preaching it. You know, we have the power of the Holy Spirit behind us. Right. And he heard that gospel, and sometimes people don't get saved right away, but we need to keep giving it out. And so he heard it, and he got to thinking about it, and God saved him. I mean, he was born again, he was changed, the police chief. And so a little more time goes by, and he says, well, I killed all those people. I ought to go back there and do something about it. So he goes back to uh, eastern Turkey. He starts preaching and it breaks out all over again, you know, and more and more people get saved. And up, a, up till about the year 850, they grow into the hundreds of thousands of people. And they call them Paulicians. And you say, where do you get the information? Well, they wrote a book called The Key of Truth, and they found this book about 1900. It explains their belief, and they were Bible-believing Christians. They taught believers' baptism and salvation by grace through faith in Christ. And they put down the church, so-called church fathers. And so we get to the year 850. We're making a little progress, so we we'll hope we'll get done in time here. But anyway, in 850, this emperor is called Theodora. And she is also mentioned in fashion books today. She liked to wear a lot of fancy clothes. She started killing these Bible-believing Baptists. And she killed, they say, up to 150,000. She had murder, had a murder. But one of the ones she killed was the father of one of her generals. His name was Carbice, and he didn't like that idea too well that her, his father had been killed. He goes back to where these people were, and they raised an army, and they set up a, their own government for 150 years. And actually, it was a, a Baptist, a Bible-believing government. Naturally, they had freedom of religion in that government. And so they go out, they send missionaries all over, and they send them into France. They call them Albigensians there. They send them into Russia in 1,000. They call them Bogomiles there, the ones that had gone to Russia. And at that time, she, banned, she tells the people, nobody is allowed to print the Bible, or nobody is allowed to copy the Bible. They didn't have print yet. And so uh, if we look back at history, we find more Greek, ancient Greek manuscripts from 850 than any time in history. Well, she controlled the Orthodox Church, but uh, she didn't apparently, was not able to control the Bible-believing Baptist in that area. And so today we find hundreds and hundreds of ancient Greek manuscripts of the text behind our King James Bible. We'll make a little progress here. We'll go to France in about the year 1180. Uh, At that time, there was a man named Peter Waldo. And uh, Peter Waldo was a very wealthy merchant. And uh, he, uh, one day he was with somebody, and it's a, really a, a, a very, uh, a very uh, different experience. I experienced this one time I was talking to a lady, and I'm glad I wasn't in an argument with her. She dropped dead right on the spot. And uh, he had his friend that was with him drop dead, and so he began to think about spiritual things. And eventually he got saved. 
And so Waldo sold half his goods, half his goods, he was a wealthy merchant, he gave to his wife and, and children, and he began to teach young men. But he joined a group called the Waldensians, and they traced their period back to about 300, although they may have gone back farther than that. And in a book by Alex, it gives the names of the pastors of these groups going back to 600. And they used the Italic text, the Old Latin text. We say the Koine Greek text, Syriac Bashida, the Old Latin, and then there is other translations backing up the authorized King James Bible. God is protecting it, in other words. So he preaches the word of God. And thousands and thousands of people are saved. And so uh, the Roman Catholic Church named a street in his honor. They call it Cursed Street. And so Waldo takes off from Lyons, France, and he's preaching all over. After that point, much of southern France becomes born-again Christians. And the guy that uh, was the general that led the Magna Carta uh, uh, to force King John to sign the Magna Carta, uh, he was a Roman Catholic general. And he came down there to southern France, and at that time they exterminated, killed nearly a couple hundred thousand uh, people. In fact, it went from that to about two million people they said were murdered at that time to wipe out the Bible-believing Christians. But they couldn't stop it. You can't stop the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And so they were preaching all over. And uh, uh, there was uh, one of these Waldensian Baptist preachers. His name was uh, Walter uh, Lolar. He was a very educated man. He went to England. He started preaching the gospel in England. And it got to the point where they said every other person was a Lolar. And that they taught believers baptism. The Bible's the only authority. And a man named Wycliffe, professor at Oxford University, accepted Christ. And he joined up with that group. And uh, people read his writings in Czechoslovakia, and so Huss read his writings, and Huss was put to death. But in the year 1467, at that time, uh, they started a new branch in, of, of churches, and they were called the Moravian churches. And the first pastors were ordained by the Waldensians. And they came to the United States of America, and uh, right, right not too far from here, New Philadelphia had an Indian colony made up of uh, these uh, uh, converted to Christ by these Moravian missionaries. And they had the true text. They taught the same doctrines we did. Jesus is the head of the church. The Bible is the final authority. They had the true text of the Word of God. Now, the Catholics were using the Vulgate, and uh, there was a man named Lorenzo Valla in 1450. He had worked for the Pope, but he wrote a book and he says, the uh, Vulgate text is not the right text. He said the Koine Greek text. That's the text behind the King James. That's the right one. And so many of the Catholic priests believe this. And so uh, in 1516, a man named Erasmus simply had this text uh, published. In 1516, the Bible says, The entrance of thy word giveth light. And in 1517, Luther nailed the 95 Thesis on the door of the church at Wittenberg protesting purgatory, protesting primarily the, the selling of indulgences. And so the Protestant Reformation broke out at that time. People started reading the scripture. But you know, they didn't go all the way with the Lord. And uh, uh, so at that time, Frederick of Saxony, who backed Luther, he, uh, uh, Frederick of Saxony, he said to Luther, he says, don't talk about believers' baptism. So Luther is a good little boy and did it. And many of the other Protestant leaders... And so, at the Second Diet of Spires, we mentioned, they got together with the Catholics, they argued, the word Protestant was mentioned, and they put to death uh, anybody that they saw was a Baptist in, in uh, uh, Holland, in a 50-year period. 15,000 men were burned alive, 15,000 women were buried alive. Well, this gets up to the time of the King James, and so, at that time, there's a man named John Reynolds, and they say he was a Puritan, but he believed in believer's baptism. He went before the King of England, and he said to the King of England, he said, uh, we ought to have a new translation, and King James listened to what he said. And so with 47 scholars, they put out the text of the King James. That was the text of the Italic text going back to the apostles, the Koine Greek text. They put that thing out. Some people say, well, it was a long time to be accepted, but there is a Baptist pastor named Gosnold, in London, he had 3,000 people came to listen to him on Sunday morning. And that church immediately started using the King James Bible. 
Well, uh, that takes us up to King James. How do we know it's, it's the Word of God? There's 15 scriptures I could quote that point to it. Right. The Bible says the Word of God liveth and abideth forever. It's a living thing that can reproduce itself. Yeah. So 200 of the modern translations, they've come, and when the translator dies, they're dead with it because they were always dead. Yep. But with the King James, it just keeps right on going. Amen. Yeah. And uh, it never stops because the power of God and the Holy Spirit is behind it. And God has put his witness to it. Right. And today, you know, in our Bible schools, they'll say, um, they'll say they, we are reverent biblicists with unquestioned loyalty to the originals. I'd like to know what scripture verse teaches such a thing. Sure, the originals are true, but Jesus said he would keep his words. Right. The words of the Lord are pure words. The silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Amen. And so God purifies it. Amen. The modern teaching is that the Bibles are like a muddy stream picking up silt as it goes down. And you go to your favorite guru or professor and he tells you what it should be. But uh, the, the biblical teaching is as it goes down through the stream, the Holy Spirit is overseeing it. And like a mountain stream coming down the mountain, it is being purified as it goes along. And so Jesus never appeals to originals. He appeals always to what he has. The Bible says thy word is true. The Bible says we can look at the perfect law of liberty. The Bible says the word of God is nigh thee, even in thy heart and in thy mouth. The Bible says that... Uh, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Well, God bless you. Amen. Brother Sanders is here and ready to take over. Amen. 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 How many of you could uh, listen to that for another couple hours? Yeah, I could too. And uh, again, uh, he's a very scholar. But, you know, by the way, did you know that all of you are Bible scholars? How many of you can understand the King James Bible? then you're all Bible scholars because, you know, we hear from these preachers all the time that there's, it's just too hard to understand. And uh, I thought, gee, I must be, I must be pretty smart. I must be. But then I find out that there's other people that are scholars too. But anyhow, I like to get uh, Pastor Bruce on my radio program. The problem is he has his own. And uh, we could do this all day. I love talking about the King James Bible. I just love talking about that book. Amen? Amen. Well, uh, about a, well, a few years back, several years back, I stopped at McDonald's one morning, and I had Pastor Tom with me. And Pastor Tom was, was just talking to everybody. Can you believe that? <laughs> Anyhow, there was this young, dark-haired preacher there, and... Uh, Today, he looks exactly the way he did several years ago, five, six years ago. And he was there, and uh, we got to talking. And that's how I came to be good friends with Pastor Dave Nadel. And uh, Pastor Dave Nadel is the one that runs this Jericho Center. He uses this, and he provided all of this for us, and we praise the good Lord. Oh, yeah, and, uh, folks, this has been a, what a blessing it has been. And it's a lot of work. Because, you know, you got to get here early. And as you know, you leave late, especially after last night. And uh, Pastor Dave is quite uh, a scholar where it comes to the nation of Israel, like John McTurner. He spends a lot of time in Israel there and uh, been wanting to, trying to get me to go there with him. Boy, I'd love to. If I could just get the time. I'm planning on someday I'm going. And uh, hopefully it's... Well, I'm still in this body. <laughs> I know I'll make it in the other. But anyhow, there's a man who's got a lot to say, very knowledgeable, and we want to, again, really express our thanks to Pastor Nate for providing us in this place here. Come on up, Pastor Dave Nate.